Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, uh, I think all of our panelists are, are present. Um, yes, I can see everyone. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I just wanted to start um, with a, a question that um, my co-organizer Tony led with uh, in yesterday's panel discussion, which is to give uh, the panelists, you know, you've all been speaking to us, uh, but I wanted to sort of give you an opportunity to engage in a dialogue with one another and, and perhaps um, share what you might have seen as connections or, or maybe you have questions that you might have for each other. And you know, I'm sort of putting you on the spot here, but I, I'd love to give you a chance to, to dialogue with one another. So, um, and, and I see that Carol and, and Debbie are, are also in the discussion. So I invite you to participate in this as well. Well, I have a thought that's relevant to um, all the talks that went on this afternoon. And I'm very sorry I couldn't come yesterday. There was a family crisis that I had to deal with, and I'm terribly sorry. Um, but this is a notion of something called uh, authenticity, a construct we've used in our research with adolescents. And it's basically uh, my, my true self is the same as what I show to people, people in my life, everyday life, right? So I think, Paul, you mentioned the no notion of authenticity many, many times in your presentation and Kate, uh, identity development and so on. I mentioned also, Danny, we looked at this among Asian American kids as well as white kids. And the fascinating thing is that, of course, discriminate feelings of discrimination had very powerful associations with depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth for these Asian American kids, more so than among, yes, the white kids who reported discrimination. But the fascinating thing was that this construct called authenticity uh, had very powerful associations with all mental health outcomes over and above things like parent criticism, my own perfectionism. So it was a bunch of discrimination. We controlled for a bunch of things, and yet this one construct called authenticity seemed to overshadow pretty much everything else. So question I asked myself and I'd like to present to you, is this sort of like mental health with a, with a big M? This, does this notion of authenticity cover all of these things? Like when you're depressed, you, you don't show yourself. When you're anxious, you don't show yourself. You follow my question? Why would it be so powerful? I actually pulled up the paper and put it on my uh, on my screen just so I could make sure I was saying had all the variables correctly. And it's true, it's correct. Yeah. So, Nia, are you um, asking Paul that question, or I'm you... asking all of you because all three mentioned today issues related to this 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 notion. So we had discrimination, perceived discrimination, parent criticism, pressure I put on myself, authenticity, and closeness to school at us, which is also Paul, you were talking about in the school context, what, what people had. So that's my question to you. I don't have an answer like beyond saying maybe it represents a, an overarching mental health construct, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think when we're considering authenticity for queer youth, where for many youth, their identities might not be immediately visible or designated or perceived by others, that there's a, a large tax uh, in hiding that a cognitive tax in constantly monitoring yourself and thinking about whether you're giving away your identity and others might perceive it or identify you. There's a emotional tax to that and feeling like you're restricted in expressing yourself. There's a social tax in not being able to really connect and have intimate relationships and develop them where there is growing interdependence and vulnerability in relationships as they become closer. and not feeling that you can have that as a queer person because you're not able to experience this authenticity. And so I think that it, for those reasons, it is such a strong predictor of mental health and in a positive sense where we, a queer youth does feel like they're able to be authentic, that it would be just as strongly related with flourishing and positive developmental outcomes. 
Oh, I, I would add to that series of taxes, uh, racial ethnic tax as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we talk about the, uh, like I'm an Asian American myself, well, myself, as are my children, but when they were growing up, and I mentioned this in this article, um, hiding aspects of your culture that you feel like are not relevant or uh, appreciated uh, by the white main mainstream culture, cultural context. So the food you eat, the accent, the clothes you wear, all of that, are like the icons, religious icons in the house and the, you know, stuff like that. So there is a huge part of oneself that I imagine that some kids feel like this should be kept um, kept hidden, not 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 just because you're uncomfortable with it or because you're a queer kid, which also we mentioned, Paul, you're in, in this paper, but because your your culture is looked down upon. And Asian kids are sort of overlooked as the goody two shoes, so you don't want to play up your Asianness. If that makes sense. I'd add in, and I think Charles in the chat actually just just mentioned something I was going to add that across the, the three talks, I, I felt like um, potentially one way, I'm going towards outside of the individual, right? Um, and so, Paul, you talked about the presence of GSAs and, and elders, I would say, who, you know, who um, kids have access to. Danny, you talked about, um, I love that, that term, micro affirmations, um, that's coming from other people, right? And obviously, Sunia, you're talking about groups coming together. So it's, it feels to me across these talks that authenticity can't really be experienced without something from the environment, something from other people, right? It's not, it, it's just not possible on yes. one's own. Uh, we call it, you can't be authentic if, unless you have unconditional acceptance from somebody mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. remotely like unconditional acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good enough to show myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering, Sunia, in these groups, in some of the work we're doing on GSAs, we look at sort of how, certain structures and processes within them that contribute to better outcomes. I would be really curious to hear what the dynamics are within the groups that, that you're working with and what you feel are sort of the active ingredients yeah. of them. It's funny you should ask, because it uh, was yesterday, the day before I said, you know what, the active ingredient really is love, a word we don't use a lot in psychological science. But what happens is we, these women all in the, the groups we've run so far in the studies, they're all that have picked their go-to people or people with whom they feel relatively psychologically safe. And all the session topics have to do with relationships, anger and how we express it, feelings of shame, um, how we feel loved and so on. So the task is for the 12 sessions, whatever we talk about in this group, you're gonna talk about with your go-to person. So you are gonna be exchanging. And so the mutual thing, not just that you feel supported, but you support them. It's essentially, the, people use words like a blanket of love develops. So by the end of these 12 weeks, I said, uh, the facilitator becomes superfluous because they have their WhatsApp chats and text chat. They're, as I said, uh, three, five years later, these people are, uh, are still together. So that I would say, uh, yeah, Paul is the active ingredient as far as I'm concerned, is a genuine comfort in this individualistic society, whatever, pull yourself up by the bootstrap. It is okay to be connected in that safe way. It's okay to ask for that. It's okay to receive that. In fact, it is very, very healthy. I really, I'll just say one more thing. I really like the comment you made, Sunia, around this uh, notion of mutuality and mutual connection and support and how important that must be for it not to be one-sided or in one direction, but mutual. Well, there are some questions in the chat, but before we get to them, I'm, I'm wondering, um, one of the, the themes that sort of comes out, at least for me, um, in these talks today, um, and some of it links back to some of what we heard yesterday, is the need for sort of more qualitative mm -hmm. investigations that that allow uh, that allow us to understand, you know, Kate, um, you know, these so-called alternative narratives uh, of the good life uh, in 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 richer fashion. And I wonder, I guess, whether you all agree with that 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 we know so very little 
about what it means to be well, what it means to flourish in these different um, populations, in these, in these different communities that have been historically you know, marginalized. Yeah, I, I, um, I would say we as scientists know so little, right? But within these communities, there's a wealth of, of wisdom and knowledge that we haven't been able to um, tap into, I think, as, as scientists because of, I would argue, structural issues and how we're funded and who the scientists are and, you know, all these, these um, sorts of things. I, and as I said earlier, I, I'm in full support of slowing down and doing more descriptive research, but I also think fundamental changes have to be made to, to the structure of our science, right? Like what are the funding mechanisms and who has access to them and how long does it take to collect data in the com with community partnerships and how does that align with the tenure track? And there's just so many um, ways in which I think we're, um, we have obstacles within our own system um, for doing this work. But I, I do think, and I'm sure the rest of you have a lot of wisdom here too, when I'm working with people who have been underrepresented or dismissed, um, it, it's a lot of, it takes a lot of gentle care and, and sort of um, respect to develop relationships with people to be able to hear their stories and their, their wisdom. And, um, and I think, I, I hope that our science can embrace that, the necess necessity of that kind of, of relationship building research, which I think is also an intervention for people to I feel like they're being listened to by scientists and represented in the science. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a soapbox. <laughs> Just piggyback, Anthony, and we'll, we'll what I thought part of your question, which is how do we define doing well? Uh, so my work has been mostly with adolescents and middle. Um, I, we define doing well among kids in ter terms of doing well at developmental tasks. We do well at school as grades, so, uh, rated by teachers, rated by peers, not self-report. And the adult world, doing well is not, is your self-report, happiness to product. Why do we not have us rated by, yeah, you're a good mom, you're a good teacher, you're a good partner. How come the developmentalists, yeah, for the children, it's all about others' reports, and for the grown-ups, doing well is by self-report, by and large. Maybe there are some studies I don't know about, whereas all or mostly others reports are, yeah, this is a good guy. You know, Anthony, as, as critical race theory moved from the law, um, to that's where it's, it was its origin. Um, it moved, one of the first fields it moved to was education. As it moved into education, um, the methodologies then and probably the methodologies now uh, were, were primarily qualitative met, uh, methods. Um, it, it's more recently that we're having discussions about, around quantitative uh, methods. We call it quantcrit. Um, but but I think initially the kind of questions we were asking, we needed to be asking using um, qualitative methodologies. Initially, more traditional qualitative methodologies. But I think now you're seeing sort of qualitative methodologies like um, testimonial or platica or other uh, other types of methodologies that are a little bit different that really turn the 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 method um, a, a, a bit to to focus specifically on populations that uh, uh, that that uh, we're engaging with and so I, that's part of how it an answer your question um, but again I think it's it's, it's evolving and I, I think even within within CRT, I mean, to to Paul's questions um, in his paper, I mean, there's developing something people are calling a hoteria methodology, a methodology that's specific to engaged with um, queer communities in the Latina and Latino community. So we're we're adding specificity to our methods as well. Fascinating. Um, let me turn to some of the questions in the chat, if I may. Um, so this is a question from Saul Castro, who Sunia, you may know Saul. Um, Thank you. Hi, Saul. How nice to see you here. 
uh, Saw asks or writes, racism and discrimination are experienced across a range of intensity and chronicity. Research often measures these experiences, not accounting for individual differences in uh, sensitivity to negative stimuli, uh, e.g. hypervigilance, anxiety. What can we learn from incorporating these aspects of psychology in addition uh, to environmental conditions? Uh, Geraldine Downey had a construct about uh, sensitivity to rejection. That could be one way. I think it's a good measure of, uh, as you say, uh, sensitivity to negative stuff coming at you. Yeah, again, I would add David Williams is, um, although he used it primarily in survey research, this hypervigilance scale, I actually think it, it can and should be adapted um, in, in qualitative research as well. Um, I, I think that idea of hypervigilance, in other words, how you prepare yourself mm -hmm. to go into this world every day, uh, knowing that you're gonna experience, or you may experience, and you probably will experience various forms of racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, uh, nativism um, in, in the various places you find yourself. And I think the, that, that preparation, that hypervigilance that David Williams talks about in his scale, it's a five item scale, I think is, is, is powerful. I think it needs to be adapted in many ways, but I like where, he, where he's at with it. Thank you, Danny. Um, there's a question from Kristen. Um, Dr. Sellers reminded us yesterday how unique to each individual being part of a group is. And Dr. McLean talked about tensions within the queer community where we're embracing certain identities, queer versus gay, for example, uh, whether qualitative or quantitative, how researchers frame questions for participants can and does impact how they respond. I'm curious to hear how each of you have navigated choosing the measure and or questions you asked if you came up against participants that felt excluded from the options somehow and how you navigated that. Yeah, I'd be happy to, I'm sure everyone has something to say about this. Um, I mean, uh, just the, the, if you're talking a quantitative or closed-ended assessment, the other box is something that should just be done away with entirely, right? Um, for gender or sexuality or race or ethnicity. Um, I've had colleagues suggest, you know, if you have a list of things people can check to say, if these terms don't apply to you, please provide us one that does, which is, still othering, but at least not other, you know? Um, so I think there's lots of literature um, and uh, Paul, you may remember that, oh, is it, what's the Institute at UCLA? Uh, is the Williams Institute? Williams Institute. Yeah, they have some great um, uh, PDFs and documents about, you know, in inclusive language and survey measures. Um, in qualitative research, I mean, one of the things we do is acknowledge our bias, right? We acknowledge that we have a stake in what we're doing, that we're human beings that our participants are seeing and interacting with. And so um, in the work that, some of the work that I was referencing that my student has been doing, she's been doing interviews and she identifies her gender and sexual identities to participants as part of building rapport and connection and trust um, with them. And, um, you know, the, the way people look matters. There's a great paper, I keep talking about Ani Rogers, she's a colleague of mine who's one of my favorites. She has a great recent paper um, where she did interviews with black adolescent girls um, and all of the interviewers were black women and the girls brought up, um, they're, they're asking about gender and, um, and racial identity and the girls all brought up hair as an important component of their identities and talked about the interviewer's hair in the interview. So, I mean, we can't pretend that the way we present ourselves or who we are isn't relevant to how people are responding to us. So. Um, um, I think we have to think really carefully about what they're seeing and hearing from us and how that might shape the way that, um, that people are, are responding, whether it's closed-ended or open-ended or interviews or, you know, all that, all that kind of thing. There's, it's definitely impacting what people will say, for sure. Um, it looks like Sunia has a question for, for Kate. Right. Yes, I do have a question. First, let me say, Kate, how delighted I am that you're emphasizing all of you this qualitative research issue that we cannot have hypotheses if we have no idea what's going on in this group that's understudied. But here's my question for you. 
uh, you mentioned Ericsson so often, I'm thinking about this group that I have uh, increasingly preoccupied with, which is people 55 and up, and more like 65 and up. And uh, the question is, so Ericsson would say, doing well would mean generativity, right? You feel like you've done for. Now, when you feel like you've done for coming generations, what good are you anymore? Who needs you anymore? There is, there, I, well, I'm, I know exactly, I'm coming across this so often the sense of what, like, you, you, I mean, uh, uh, Paul, you mentioned the mutuality. I help you, you help me. I'm of some use to you. Now you're with this big boomer generation, many of whom are feeling like, okay, so I did my job. I wrote my book. I raised the kids, I have grandchildren. Now what? Who am I, what am I worth? I think Jeannie's talk yesterday spoke a little bit to this in the way that we conceptualize aging, right? Mm -hmm. So when we have a culture in which we um, are rather negative about age, aging, then people are likely to, to feel useless, right? I mean, I guess I would argue that generativity, um, we have to find ways for people to continue to feel like they have something to offer. Um, and one of the tasks that Nick and I have been working on in our these intergenerational encounters is how do we set it up so that youth um, understand, you know, that there is something to be gained from hearing stories from elders and how do elders understand there's something to be gained from hearing the stories of youth, right? It's, it's a two-way um, street and that kind of, um, back to relationships, right? That kind of relationship um, dynamic, I would hope would, would um, help elders to feel a sense of purpose, but I do feel like a lot of it is our, our ideas about aging. And so, in communities that value elders, um, we would see, you know, more purpose. Um, and, and Jeannie would, I think she would agree with that. <laughs> um, just monitoring the chat here. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, this is a question for, for both Kate and um, Danny, um, who, who, you know, you, you both strikes me, uh, uh, you're already doing the qualitative work that I, you know, gave voice to earlier. And I wonder, um, well, first of all, I, this was a point that I tried to ask and I'll try to ask again, whether you two actually see commonality in the way that you are kind of, Kate, defining, um, you know, these, these alternative narratives around belonging that are necessarily, it seems to me, tethered to this, you know, identification of being part of a marginalized group and, and um, Danny, your conceptualization of a racial microaffirmation is also, if I understand correctly, necessarily tethered to, um, uh, you know, some sort of response to a racial microaggression. That, that, that this is part and parcel of, um, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like wellness, if you will. Um, is that something that rings true? Yes, it does. But again, um, the, the idea, when I was listening to Kate, I, and she talks about the master narrative. Um, I, what, what CRT and the law, and, and I'm speaking now of Derek Bell and Richard Delgado uh, and others, uh, Pat, uh, um, Patricia Williams, and other legal scholars, critical race legal scholars, they, they, they would call, the, they, they would look at the master narrative a little differently than, 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 than Kate was looking at it. I mean, they would see the master narrative as a narrative rooted in white supremacy and institutional racism. It would be the story of, 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 the, uh, of, how, of, of, um, of how we view color um, and how people of color are viewed. Um, they would they would respond with something called a counter narrative, and I think Richard and Delgado and Derek Bell and others have really laid out what that counter narrative looks like. And so, and so the counter narrative is really a challenge to that dominant uh, narrative or what they call majoritarian story, um, because it really challenges that dominant narrative. One, it two, it it it, it places uh, people of color at the center of the narrative, um, uh, this counter narrative. Um, and it challenges deficit framing of, 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 uh, of people of color. 
Um, and it also sees people of color's experiences as rich, as, as important, uh, as obviously worthy of narrative um, and, and the ability to tell that story. Um, you know, in some ways, it, 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 it comes from some other literature in, in public, in, public uh, in urban planning called the asset-based um, work um, or the strength-based research in, in urban planning um, that we look at the strengths of communities. We, we, we find the strengths in communities um, and, and we, um, we, we build on those strengths. And so I think that's what the counter narrative does. Um, in, 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 but at the same time, challenging the, the dominant narrative, what, what it would either be called the master narrative, which I, we rarely use, but we'd call it the majoritarian. Yeah, um, Moin and I, when we chose to use the term alternative narrative, had a long discussion about whether or not to use the term counter narrative. And um, we chose alternative narrative thinking that counters were part of that, um, but alternative narratives can exist alongside master narratives without challenging them, right? I mean, that's, and counters are actually saying, hey, this is wrong, here's another story. Alternative narratives may not even be known outside of the group, right? They can really be um, more hidden. So yeah, I think counter narratives, actually I've been thinking about this in terms of youth development. So related to many of, many of the talks, um, when is it that people move from telling an alternative narrative to a counter narrative and what are the supports necessary for that kind of challenge of, of the dominant um, story? And I'd also just say that um, I definitely think master narratives are rooted in those systems of, of hierarchy and power, whether it's white supremacy or patriarchy or um, all, all of the um, historical um, historic ways in which the status quo has been maintained to, to benefit those in power. Um, different narratives speak to different life courses or types of stories, et cetera. But that was, that's central to, to our, our theorizing um, also um, is, is recognizing how those systems are infused in our, our very identities um, for sure, yeah. And, and, and there's also a growing literature in American Indian studies on things called story work. Uh, and other methodologies in, 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 in um, what some people call tribal crit uh, that I think are really, really important. Uh, so. Thank you for that. Um, I, I feel like now that I have you here, I, 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 would, I, I wanna ask all these questions. I'll just maybe um, push back one bit, another attempt here, which um, Kate, you know, you, I think you make this point um, in your talk, and I know in some of your writings that, you know, this alternative narrative around belonging is not just, you know, a route to well-being, but is itself a kind of well-being. And I, I feel like in this discussion of flourishing, that point should not be lost. And I wonder if, I, mean, I guess I invite all of you to expand on that, that, that why isn't it, why isn't these alternative, however you want to call it, accounts of well-being or uh, narratives rather, themselves, how we should be thinking about well-being. Like these are not, you know, I'll stop there. I'll let you guys expand. I really, I really appreciate and I'm excited by Kate, the, your presentation around narratives, because as I was listening to your talk, it was bringing to mind some work that I've read recently among queer youth and, and looking at their future aspirations and how a number of these aspirations fit into that kind of master narrative or kind of hegemonic narrative around starting a family, having kids, getting married, having a high paying job and career, and then comparing queer youth's responses on that to hetero cis youth and showing that there are differences and framing them as negative and how that ties into this kind of larger problematic narrative. And it, you're providing some language of how to kind of critique that and see that as um, problematic. And then to Anthony's point, I guess my question would be, well, then not only how do queer youth um, form their own narrative, but how is that positive? Like how, how is there this positive narrative in terms of 
um, promoting flourishing and thriving. Um, I just would love to hear you say more about um, maybe some things that you found or some thoughts on how we can better address that in our work. Um, well, those seem like really big questions. Um, and Anthony, I wanna say, I, I'm, I'm totally hearing your question. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I, I just go back to this idea that we, we so easily rely on, on what has existed before, right? So the measures that, you know, satisfaction with life or whatever <laughs> other well-being measure that doesn't capture this idea of collective um, belonging or collective well-being or collective health, as, as Debbie said. So I think it takes imagination of, of conceptual development and measurement development um, to, to bring into the center this idea of belonging as the thing, mm -hmm. right? As it's not positive affect necessarily, although positive affect might be the, the outcome of the, of the belonging, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there is a conceptual piece and a measurement piece. I keep talking about measurement, but, I, but that's our bread and butter, right? Is measurement is how do we, how do we assess these things? Um, I'm curious if others have ideas about how to, I mean, so Paul, to your point, I mean, part of that is, um, you know, what we ask people um, in our in our measures and what they tell us about, you know, how to how to understand their um, personal and collective well being or health. Um, but I'm curious if others have thoughts about bringing that belongingness into the center of, of our science. There's one one item question, Kate, that is, again, so powerful in our study of mothers. Now, I feel seen and loved for the person I am at my core. One item. And it's a very powerful predictor, again, of different aspects of mental health and well-being. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but... It, it is, although I go back to, to Danny, 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 to your talk of what does it look like? And it's the nod, right? So all of a sudden it's like, oh, you can see it when you have the vivid, the story of it or the, the actual observation to know what that one item refers to. Unconditional acceptance. You know, I, I'm also thinking about, because this was helpful in our work, um, uh, Claude Steele's concept of self-affirmation. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, and, and then subsequent folks who, have, who, who tested that, uh, people like Sherman and Cohen. But, but, um, but I think that, you know, the idea of, of affirming yourself, um, and I think in the Sherman and Cohen, Cohen research, they, they have students, um, Say something really positive about themselves. I, I'm not sure if I got the quite the, the prompt right, but uh, but that has effects. That has the you know so some some short term effects, some long term effects. But I think that that self affirmation I think is a really powerful tool. At least it was as we were developing uh, our, our thinking around these areas around uh, racial micro affirmations. I will invite my uh, colleague, Tony Burrell, who has a question. Oh, you, you know, I have several here. So let me try to calm down before I throw them all out into the room at once. Um, I think, you know, especially on the heels of a, of a mention of, of self-affirmation, I think I'm gonna try to make this question relevant in, in this way. Um, <clears throat> self-affirmation is fascinating because there seems to be some benefit to affirming important values relative to values that may not be important. So the sort of the contrasting condition. And it seems to me that the, the, the benefits or effects of self-affirmation have mostly been tested and seem most evident in context of stress. So it's when you might be disparaged that having affirmed yourself seems really beneficial. And we know much less about the benefits of affirming oneself when there's no stress. Or what is the signature of that? We, we, it's not so much that I would say there is not one, but I, I've not seen the, the wealth of studies that say, here's the signature of self-affirming outside of the context of stress or challenges and that kind of thing. So it might be sort of a, an artifact of how we tend to study self-affirmation. But the corollary to that, I think I have a question about it, is this quote. I mean, all of you have, I have, I have a couple of pages of notes of things you've all said. Um, that I will eventually steal and use as my own, by the way, I should let you know, but there's some elegant phrasings across these talks that I appreciate. But one that we open with, um, Sunia, you know, you, you said, um, nothing heals like love in real life. I mean, it's gorgeous. I, I want to get a tattoo that says that at some point. That's just, an, I mean, but it, it, it made me wonder about real life. And 
maybe this is a question about measure, measuring flourishing, which kind of requires us to show up in a way that may be a little less like real life. We have to kind of show up as researchers or investigators, even when we're attempting to be at a distance. And I just wondered what you all thought about flourishing in the whatever way you approach it, define it, think about it, assess it in real life. Um, the groups, Sunia, that you opened with that themselves lend themselves to a kind of belonging and the ripple effects that seem beautiful and the, and, and the impacts, are there organic manifestations of that outside of groups that are brought together for one reason or another, where might we stumble across that kind of ripple effect of belonging when we're not there to assess it? What do alternative narratives look like when we haven't asked you to narrate them? What do micro affirmations look like when we're not studying them? How do they organically unfold in the context of everyday life and identity disclosures? All of you mentioned these things. What is identity when you're not disclosing it? If those are potential sources of flourishing, are, 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 a, are we essentially studying our studying of flourishing or is flourishing out in the world, whether we're assessing it or not? And what might that look like? I have to admit that whenever you first approached me to be on this panel, it was fairly intimidating because I have to admit that I haven't studied flourishing and that so much of the work that I've done has been around bias-based harassment and all the negative consequences of it and looking at mental health uh, disparities and only recently looking at um, kind of resilience and these buffers against these negative outcomes. And it really gave me pause to think what would flourishing be in the context of queer youth development? It's, it's no one, no one's ever asked me that. Uh, it's, it always feels like we're just constantly responding to a litany of oppression and discriminatory acts and trying to just push through that as opposed to also thinking more broadly about what does it mean to flourish? And I, th I think that's gonna be a challenge in moving forward. And I, it's really sparked me to think about in kind of some of Kate's work to uh, collect narratives among the queer youth who we're working with to see how much we're, we must be missing when all we're doing is giving them surveys, asking them about how depressed they are, how anxious they are, and then thinking it's a good thing or it's enough of a good thing to see low levels of depression and anxiety, but not to say that that is reflecting their sense of joy or mutuality and connection with their peers and other adults and what that might go on in terms of promoting a sense of purpose and feeling like they're a part of something greater than themselves and having a sense of meaning in their lives. And perhaps whenever it gets to that, there isn't like this master narrative of what that looks like. The, ultimately what a youth might find meaningful and enriching in their life is going to be different. And that's a, a challenge to kind of the quantitative side where things try to be standardized. We ask the same questions, same people and um, expect them and interpret them the same. So I think that the, just for your question, it's really pushed me to see okay, how can we really expand massively in, in this work so that we can capture flourishing and what it might represent for youth? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. You know, the other day, someone sent me a, a short video of um, three astronauts um, who, that I, I have to apologize, I can't remember their names, but they were, they were historic figures. And now, but what caught my attention was how they had some early interviews of them once they got back uh, to Earth after uh, they were the first ones to see the Earth from space. And they, they had the early interviews, uh, these old interviews, I think they're on a television program. Uh, and they were describing what they had saw. 
Um, and when they went back and they re-interviewed one of them and something he said really, I thought was really important. He said, what I wish we would have had, we were three um, astrophysicists, scientists looking at the earth. I wish we had a poet with us looking at the earth. And I, I, I think um, that's how I approach my work. I mean, it's interdisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary. So when you ask a question about flourishing, not only do I want different folks in the room helping me maybe design a study about how we look at flourishing, but also who we're gonna look at. I mean, how we're gonna sort of answer that question. Um, and because my, way, my work focuses on race, I probably would start by asking people of color, students of color, adolescents of color, women of color, um, LGBT students and, and folks of color. Um, that's where I, I, I would probably start. I wouldn't end there, I, I hope, but I, I think I would start there. I, I would just jump, I was gonna say something similar, which is to ask the people you know, that we're working with, what is it, when do you feel good? When do you feel joy? When do you feel like you're flourishing? Um, and I mean, Paul, we, the earlier question about how we ask our questions, it's such an interesting reflection, right? To think, gosh, all I'm asking about is <laughs> how bad things are. Um, and the community work that I've done, uh, sometimes I'm a member of the community I'm working with and sometimes I'm not. I now think that I can't really do, I'm sure you all would agree, can't really do work um, without someone on the team being a member of the community just for trust building and, um, and connection, but um, I've had two really, what I, I think are really successful interview projects where the questions, the interview questions came from members of the community. Um, one in which the, the, the person who developed the questions was not at all a scientist or you know at all related to academia. And when he came up with these questions, I thought, that kind of work, that's sort of, I don't know, the structure of that interview just looks weird to me. Of course, I mean, I'm not a member of this community and, and the, the interview is beautiful. I mean, the way people respond to it, I was just like, I would never have developed these questions or in this order. So I really think the more that we can partner with people and you know, ask questions like, what do you want me to ask you about? And I actually started adding that to the end of my surveys or my interviews is, is there something I should have asked you about that I didn't? And people come up with great stuff, you know? And so that to me is a way to get it flourishing is trust our participants as knowing about their lives, right? And and allowing them to, to partner with us in a, in a different kind of way than usual. Thank you. Tony, did you have other questions that you want to ask? I don't know where to start. Please jump in as I sift through a couple here. Looking at the chat here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, um, let me throw this one out. Um, see how I'm doing on time, but I certainly don't want to. Um, if we have a time, let me throw this one out. Um, uh, this again is relevant to the entire panel. I'm curious what you all might think about this in your in your work and your contributions to the to the area in which you've you've um, done your inquiry. Um, I was thinking about Danny. Your 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 talk and situating it in history of Chester Pierce, and you mentioned the term 52 years ago. <laughs> it kind of caught me for a second. 52 years, I've been thinking about microaggressions. And I think about over the arc of that 52 years, I could turn on the TV probably tonight and see people um, denying you know, the slogan, thinking of a master or alternative narrative of Black Lives Matter and or um, comments about critical race theory and people at parent teacher meetings arguing whether or not we should even go that direction or not. And I just wonder, you know, what will it take? Think about the thought work, time, studies, energy, passions that have gone into producing the scholarship that you all have produced and the literature that you both are sitting on top of and others who have contributed based upon your own work. You know, what is the piece of evidence in your arc that you think uh, you might weight as heavier, like we don't have it yet, but boy, if we had this one piece of evidence, um, like what are we waiting on that if we had it, if we better understood, if we could measure, name, draw inferences about 
is there something that you think about the trajectory of your work that if we only had this one piece, and maybe that's reductionistic, but if we had this one piece, it would really be a parameter shift upwards in our understanding, our advancing, and our understanding of flourishing or resilience to whatever you might speak to. Is there something that holds greater water in, in your thinking than others? I'm asking really simple questions, I realize. So I'll give you a quick, but, but I, as you, I, I'm just curious in your, in your thinking, your reflections on these things. Are you asking Danny? Every, the entire panel, yeah. Anyone, anyone who, yeah. Say the sentence one more time. Sure, the, the question, um, we can be after, we can be studying something for a long time and I'm wondering, is there a piece of evidence, a kind of evidence, a naming of a term, a finding, a finding that if we had it, it would really be a parameter shift upwards in our ability to contribute, to help people fare better, to flourish, or to be more resilient, however you might think about that. Is there a kind of thing that we're waiting on? If we only had that, things would be different. Or is it just a sustained crawl toward a better future? So I, I just have one to suggest, it's doing for the greater good. Measuring that as we get Ah. About adults, not necessarily older people, all of us. To what extent are you committed to doing for the greater good, not just as my self report, but from people who know you and will vouch for the fact that yes, you do give? I would love that. Thank you. I think um, I. I do think there's a lot of evidence we still need. And, and I would point to things like, you know, the role of structures in people's, you know, flourishing or identity or well being. But I also think we have a lot of data that isn't being attended to. And oh, so I also think a lot about how we communicate our science and how do we get, you know, people to listen in terms of policy change or the, you know, the legal system. Um, so I guess that's one place I think is, is it's, it's more of um, convince, finding the right way to convince people to listen to what I, what's there. I still think we have lots to do, of course, but I also think there's a lot there that we haven't been able to successfully communicate in the ways that I think we all would want to, who care about the law and schools and healthcare and, and all those sorts of things. And actually one of your colleagues at Cornell, Neil Lewis Jr. wrote a really nice paper recently about science communication and our responsibility. Um, so yeah, got, got people there thinking about this too. And, and, Anthony, that's a really good question. I, I pre appreciate you asking it. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna delve into another pre presentation I'm giving here at ARA in a couple of days. Okay. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, it's based on a forward that I wrote for a book that I'm gonna discuss it on coming on. Uh, and it, it's, um, and in that forward, I, I go back to Derek Bell's um, re revised, uh, I'm sorry, um, second edition of Faces at the Bottom of the Well, subtitled The Permanence of Racism. And um, the person who wrote the forward um, for the 2018 re uh, edition is Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow. And um, <laughs> this, this essay, um, it was really, when I found it, I go, wow, I mean, this is, um, she really, really enlightened me and got me thinking in, in so many different ways. But, but, but to your question, I'm just gonna read her, uh, just a quote that she made. She said, reading, reading Bell's words today, 25 years after the book was published, I find it difficult to refute the nuanced argument he weaves so gracefully and unapologetically in his pages. I, I, I read his words and chills sweep over me. Something lurks in these pages that is eerily prophetic, almost haunting, and yet at the same time, oddly reassuring. The truth about race and justice in America is always more liberating than the alternative. Whether you believe our nation can be saved or redeemed, 
I urge you to read or reread this book, Face at the Bottom of the Well, um, with, and discuss it with others. Ask yourself whether there may be truths lurking here that we have yet to face. Ask yourself if you're willing to commit yourself to the struggle for racial justice, even if the battle can't ever be won. After years of ambivalence on that final point, my answer is now yes, forever yes. And so that's a question, I think, the questions of the permanence of racism that Bell posited uh, in a lot of his work, but certainly in Face at the Bottom of the Well in 1992, which is now, what, 30 years ago, um, is a question that, that, that Michelle Alexander helped me sort of um, revisit, if you will, uh, with her words. I, I really appreciate how she pushed me again, pushed us who read that piece again. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you. I, I see that Carol uh, Riff is still has, has uh, soldiered on and with us. And uh, I, Carol, if you're with us, if you want to um, chime in, um, I invite you to do so before we um, sort of close here. Um, okay. Um, thank you. I, I tried to do my video, but it says the host has stopped it. So <laughs> you can hear me, right? Um, yeah. You can hear me. So I'm just listening to all of this with great fascination as kind of an old timer uh, in in this in this field of well-being, flourishing, positive functioning, what whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm struck by how we kind of recycle back around to the same questions uh, over and over again with. Uh, I think, um, in, in my view, I think insufficient attention to history. And, uh, and I'm not just talking about, you know, the history of, you know, the, the period of time when I got into this business and I was, you know, trying to figure out, well, what is positive functioning and what have people written about it and how should we think about it? And I spent an enormous amount of time um, reviewing lots of different perspectives on that, but there's a deeper, deeper history. Uh, maybe one way uh, to get a feel for that would be to read Darren McMahon's book called The History of Happiness, um, which, uh, I mean, it goes back to the, I mean, it's across the centuries. Um, and I think it's really important to sometimes take that really broad sweep because one of the things I learned, and there's also an amazing book um, by uh, Richard Cohn called Hero, Artist, Sage, or Saint um, about uh, different periods of human history in which maybe rationality was elevated as the ultimate goal of human functioning or close contact with the divine or the Renaissance artistic expression, all of those kinds of things. When you take that really broad sweep, um, I think one of the things that emerges is that you see actually across history and across um, cultures even, I think the most universally endorsed aspect of what it means to be well is to be socially connected. Mm -hmm. it, it is basically, I mean, which is, those, those are themes that have just come through repeatedly um, in all of the comments made by each of you uh, representing research in groups that are challenged and stigmatized in different ways. But I think that the social connection part of who we are, I think is a, a fundamental part of what it means to be human. Um, that will always be, I think, a central piece of what we mean when we talk about human flourishing gets articulated in different ways. Um, but the other thing I think I wanted to draw some attention to, which I, I think has been suggested in some of Sonia's comments um, about you know, making a valuable contribution. Um, I, for whatever reasons, um, love the writings of Aristotle. I mean, despite the fact that he lived in an era that was, you know, had slavery and women were not, you know, <laughs> viewed as 
legitimate citizens, whatever. There, there's an amazing book called Aristotle's Way written by Edith Hall um, that distills a lot of his key messages. But I, I really do believe one of the central key messages is the mes message about virtue. And that we really need to push ourselves hard to think about what does it mean to live a virtuous life so that his ultimate definition of eudaimonic well-being was activities of the soul in accord with virtue. And then he made, you know, pretty big effort to try to articulate different varieties of virtue. But the one that he, I think, put at the top of the list, what is the highest of all human virtues, um, is I think really the essence of eudaimonia. It's, it's the kind of uh, personal excellence and personal becoming that I think is front and center in any developmental perspective about anything. Development is ultimately about becoming. It's about, it's about becoming your best self, uh, which I think never, never ends. Uh, whatever the context you're in, whatever advantage or disadvantage you start out with, I think uh, to me, that's that is probably what I would put, you know, at the centerpiece of of what human wellness flourishing entails. Yes, it's the, the social connectedness. We cannot live without that. That's a central feature of what it means to, um, I think, go through life in a way that is gratifying and meaningful and purposeful. But as developmentalists, and I think all of us share a commitment to the very idea, the beautiful idea of human development, I think it is very much about realizing your talents and capacities. And um, I'm with Kate in uh, basically believing we cannot talk about realization of talents and capacities, and they're unique for each of us because we each come into this life with, that's what the daemon means. It's like the unique spirit that each of us has. We, we cannot actually be realizing our talents and potentials if we are living in contexts that are just profoundly unequal. Um, I mean, the structural components of, of inequality, um, I think, have to be center stage. They, they are embedded in, I think, in virtually all of the topics that we have talked about here, you know, different kinds of stigmatized groups. Um, we, I think we all have to really dig deeply to think about impediments, impediments to human becoming. And that may seem like it's antithetical to the goal of this conference, which is really about getting off of the negative and into the positive, getting into the positive so that you're talking about flourishing. But I don't actually think um, we're ever going to really, I don't know, get in close proximity to these, these distant targets that we're all reaching for if we are not simultaneously working with the negatives and the positives, um, which is you know, my, my big commentary about the positive psychology movement, the positive psychology movement by even naming itself, the positive psychology movement basically said, we need to go in that direction, that it's that valence that we need to pay attention to. And I just, I don't actually think that's gonna help us understand the obstacles that people are up against, how they negotiate them, how they get through them. Um, so Anthony, you probably should never have asked me to open my mouth because I just have, I have too many thoughts, too many things I want to say, mostly that I've really, I've really enjoyed listening to everybody in, in this two day extravaganza. I have just gotten so much out of it. And my final comment would be that I think bringing together people like this who are, uh, you know, they come with different kinds of expertise uh, talents, whatever. It's so important to bring people together like this and get them to mix it up and to do it, I think, repeatedly, to do it repeatedly because we all need to be stretched um, by listening to what others have to say. Thank you.
Thank you, Carol. Really appreciate those insights and remarks. Um, I, I just, um, just in the minute we have remaining here, I, before I turn it over to my colleague and co-organizer, Tony Porter, I just want to thank um, everyone on the panel today, Sunia, Paul, Kate, and Danny, for sharing your, um, your just really vital work with us. Um, and um, I hope we can continue the, the conversation offline. But thank you for, for coming and, and sharing your work. Let me just jump in on that wave. Um, I'm so I'm so grateful for um, Carol's remarks there because it allows me to sort of push my prepared thoughts to the side and just um, be my authentic self, if you will, and and extend the the gratitude that Anthony just shared to all of you, but also our colleagues who joined us yesterday to fill out the entire symposium. Um, two things have happened in stretching this out across two days is one is I had the overnight to, to reflect and consider the remarks that were shared yesterday in preparation for today. And even I, I suspect it's already doing its work. The, some of the things that were shared yesterday really created a container um, that, that I didn't have yesterday, but now I had going into today. So this point about doing this, but doing it repeatedly is already sort of paying dividends. Um, the second thing is, let me just say thank you all on behalf of the Bronfer Brenner Center for Translation and Research. Um, this morning, we had one of our planned cabinet meetings. And um, instead of canceling it in preparation for the convening today, we went ahead with it. And it gave me a chance to talk to some colleagues at the center about what they were hearing. They've joined us for the past couple of days. A number of them are still stuck around for the, for the whole thing. And I was just enamored with the wonderings that people shared, what they heard, what they took away from. And I wanna sit with that too. I wanna to soak that in the wonderings. I, I like that part of this, but I suspect the next, next task for us will be into turning the wonderings into sort of actionable insights, um, actionable insights for our research and scholarship, for our practice, and maybe even policy where those of us are inclined to do such things to kind of push on systems and structures at, at a policy level. Um, but that's the exciting part um, to see where this goes. I mentioned this yesterday that uh, we are fortunate to be working in partnership with the American Psychological Association to take some of the ideas um, for those who are so inclined to share those ideas that you've prepared here in a book format. Um, there's just another medium there. Uh, I, the number of books that I've jotted down here, even starting beginning with Carol's talk, had it just it was like a good read. So I could so, you know, a number of books were already sort of admitted there. And then throughout, um, we heard the faces at the bottom of the well today, a book that kind of grew up with um, the number of books. And I think that's another way we can contribute is to turn these thoughts into something that's portable, uh, that people can carry with them and help engage others who were not here part of the symposium, but to help engage them with these ideas as well. And to Carol's words again, to mix it up with them in that way. So I hope we will extend invitations to you very shortly at the follow-up of this, of this convening. If you are so inclined to share your remarks in, in a book, that we would absolutely love to put that together in a volume. Um, and maybe invite others who were not as part of the symposium, but to share their remarks in the, in the volume as well. So you will see, receive correspondence from us about an invitation to contribute to that to that volume if you're if you're willing to do so. Um, but let me just end where I need to, which is just to say thank you for enriching us and to pouring into our, our, our thoughts, our hearts, our minds about what flourishing might be, what it might need to be, and what it might be that we haven't mentioned yet, um, the wonderings as it goes forward here. But just thank you for joining in, joining us with this and. Um, I've not said so, Anthony, but thank you uh, for partnering with us in this regard. It's been absolutely delightful. Um, uh, he and I, are, we, we did post, we were, we did our postdoc together at Notre Dame, and I, he may not admit it, but so many of our heroes are here in in, in this session, and so um, sort of a dream come true that a number of you said yes to us. So um, thank you kindly. So thank you for your leadership, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony. And Sarah. Absolutely, indeed. Juan and Sarah for helping the whole thing go. Thank you so much. Take care.